Before I begin this review, I wanted to give a couple of points of disclosure. The first being is that this book was provided to me for free uh, by my contact at Carranceway Publishers. That's the people who do Medieval Warfare. This book is printed under the History Press, um, but it was provided to me. It's a 15 pound value or thereabouts, and it was sent to me from overseas. This was basically the easiest way for them to get me uh, a physical copy of this book uh, that I could do a review on. And uh, what that really means is there's really no value in me sending it back. I'm going to keep the book, uh, but it should not uh, really sway this a review in any way or the other. I'm going to give it my honest opinion and review from that regard, um, and I'm really keeping it because uh, the value is low enough that it really should not impact anything. Unfortunately, with print media, this is honestly one of the easier ways to do it. Um, and if there are any concerns with that from an ethical standpoint, please let me know. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep this 15 pound value book. Uh, the second point of disclosure is that I do actually have well, a somewhat loose association with the author, because the author is Anthony Cummins, uh, who you may know from his YouTube channel, and I've done a couple of small videos uh, with him and some other YouTubers. Um, again, this is a very loose professional relationship. Um, it does not have any real bearing, again, on the review that I'm going to be giving this book or my thoughts on it. Uh, with all of that said, uh, let's take a look at the Illustrated Guide to Viking Martial Arts. The Illustrated Guide to Viking Martial Arts is a rather interesting book, especially for someone like me who comes from a, a strict kind of HEMA background uh, when it comes to my understanding of martial arts and, uh, and European martial arts especially, uh, because we all know that, well, there isn't really anything written down or really as an authoritative source on how the Vikings actually fought and what their martial arts were. So to see a book called The Illustrated Guide to Viking Martial Arts is kind of interesting and really begs the question, well, exactly how are you going to give an illustrated guide to this? Now, this is something of an odd thesis statement that Anthony actually gives uh, in the book, uh, both in a kind of a statement early on, as well as additionally peppered throughout the book, as he speaks to exactly how he's jumping to some conclusions. Uh, I've spoken before in, in, in kind of HEMA regards about how my thoughts on exactly how you actually build a martial art off of some of these sources, because you have a lot of, uh, especially with HEMA, the, the later martial arts such as German or Italian longsword, you have much of the information already there and only a little bit needs to be plugged in. I would reference that uh, very much in the same way I would reference something like Dino DNA from Jurassic Park. Uh, you are plugging in what we know from other martial arts that are alive and active to uh, create a broader and bigger picture of martial arts. And that's exactly what's being done here. It's just being done to a much larger extreme. You're plugging in a lot more from other martial arts. Anthony comes from a background in Japanese martial arts. And so he's coming through it honestly from a very different mindset than you might see from many kind of standard HEMA practitioners. Now what he's actually doing, his general statement within this book is he's going to look at uh, the stories that are told, the Viking sagas, and he's going to look at the descriptions of violent acts, the martial arts acts that are described in these sagas, and then try to build a guide to what that might look like uh, based on that. Now that's, that's a really big leap, uh, honestly, in a lot of ways, but I think he does it in uh, what's actually very respectable mean because he, he does speak to the fact that the audience of uh, the Viking sagas would actually understand themselves what martial arts would look like and what their fighting styles would look like. And so, uh, to his credit, he's, he does make a point that you know these are exaggerated examples of uh, fighting styles, but that there's probably some thread of truth in there because people would expect that if you're going to hack off a limb, uh, there's only so much of that you can do, um, and there's only so far that can be taken. You're not going to be cutting trees in half, although you might see things like that in some of the Viking guys. Uh, the Vikings themselves were, uh, were actually kept pretty toned down considering the kind of fantastical elements of the sagas. So basically what Anthony is doing is he is, well, he's taking these uh, very small snippets and he's then expanding on them to try to describe, well, how might this be done in reality? And this can have some really interesting effects, uh, both for uh, kind of solving that problem and actually saying exactly how this could actually be done, uh, as well as, uh, unfortunately, leaving it open to some rather broad interpretations that 
honestly don't really necessarily always pass the Marshall validity test that I would look for. It's also worth noting that within this book, uh, I don't really consider it a true guide to martial arts. In fact, I think that the title of this, uh, unfortunately, is not necessarily reflective of the content contained within the pages because, well, you can't pick up this book and read it and have a true martial understanding of how to fight like the Vikings would have fought. And this is gonna be a little bit different from how you might be able to go pick up many other manuals or treaties or interpretive works that people have done within the historical European martial arts community. That said, it's a very fascinating read. And honestly, I read it cover to cover and uh, I kinda wanted to try some of this stuff. It's really intriguing, especially when you consider where he pulls in some of the other martial arts sources in order to back up some of his claims on how something might be done. Let's actually look at some examples of that. You might have something as simple as just an overhead cut. Uh, this would be pretty much the standard cut within just about every major martial art out there that uses a sword. And uh, certainly while, of course, this type of thing you would think would just be a given, uh, he is actually able to give some saga references. And it is very interesting small things such as, and clave him down both helm and head and mail clad body, or, and smote his sword into his head and clave it down to the jaw teeth. And these are things where it's basically just calling out information on exactly where the cut is coming from. And then it kind of jumps into, well, let's just assume that it's a Viking holding a sword and a shield and what would that actually look like? And again, we actually have some fairly decent points of knowledge for that, especially within uh, Hema. Uh, you have something like sword and buckler. Of course, it gets taken to a slightly different extreme within the Viking context. Um, but these are things that when you read it, it passes the martial validity sniff test. But then you get to some things that may not such as the low-level strike to the leg. This is a cut intended to sever the leg at any point from below the knee to the ankle. And again, this is a subgenre of downward strike to the shoulder. However, this time there's a fundamental difference in stance and posture, and therefore it has been divided into two versions. And then he goes into speaking to uh, some of the, the quotes from the sagas. Thorarin cut the leg from Thorir at the thickest of the calf and slew both his fellows. And while certainly you're pulling that from the text of the sagas and it makes sense, someone's cutting someone's leg out from under them, how do you apply that to some sort of martial practice? Well, honestly, the example that Anthony gives is, well, kind of strange. It's kind of two examples. One is someone is a little bit higher than you, like they're standing up on a hill, uh, that they're above you and you're just kind of cutting at their legs because it's what's in front of you. And the other one is an opponent kind of on your level and you kind of crouch down to make the strike because honestly reaching down with a single-handed Viking style uh, sword isn't really going to work all that well. I don't know if that passes the martial validity test because crouching down to make a strike uh, is a hard, large expenditure of effort in terms of getting back out of such a crouch and certainly the way that it is illustrated in this guide uh, is not something that I would actually recommend if you were actually in a fight. But it's really hard to kind of, again, draw the exact context uh, as they would be from the sagas and you're really having to make some rather large leaps to come to that conclusion. And while there is this example where, again, I don't know exactly how those leaps are made, they're just kind of presented as information, some of the other ones that seem actually more ridiculous actually have better things to back them up. For example, catching a spear. Bet you didn't see that one coming. This is the concept that within the, uh, the Viking culture, it was actually a great show of strength and martial prowess to be able to catch a spear in flight that someone would throw a spear at you and you could reach out and snatch it out of the air to be returned to them in an equally violent fashion is a very interesting concept. And uh, certainly there are references in the saga to this happening, such as Aldulf the Easterling snatches up a spear and launches it at Gunnar. Gunnar catches the spear with his hand in the air and hurled it back at once, and it flew through the shield in the Easterling too and so down into the earth. Now you could easily call that a uh, kind of a relative extreme of the fantasy aspect of Viking sagas, and yet there's actually some realistic, very real and well documented aspects of this actually being done. Just not in Viking culture, it's actually a completely different culture. Quoting the book, historically this has been recorded in other cultures. It is a skill attributed to Celtic or Iron Age warriors and can be seen in histories and contemporary fighting arts called Lu the warrior way of the Hawaiian people. Modern documentary evidence has shown these warrior people catching and throwing back 
not only a single spear, but a succession of them. There is a custom of throwing a spear at a visiting tribal chief with the purpose of him catching it and showing his prowess. What's more, Anthony actually goes into the process of how you would actually train to do such a ridiculous thing because honestly, you're probably not just gonna go out there and catch a spear. But he speaks to the uh, aspect that people would actually train for that and that they would have spears, probably not sharpened, lobbed at them and they would sidestep and smack it out of the air. And as you got better at knocking it down out of the air as it passed by you, you would then get better and better to the point where you could actually reach out and actually put a, your hand on it and get a grip and catch it. And that's actually a really fascinating concept. And again, he's drawing this out of other cultures, but he's applying it to the Viking martial arts. And I think that's where this book actually really shines is it shows just how much can be done with so very little information. Even something as uh, strange and vast, but also sparing in details as Viking sagas could actually realistically be used to try to piece together what a martial art might look like. And that is a long dead martial art, one that we simply don't have the sources to re really well recreate it. And yet we can get some interesting insight. Now again, that's not to say that this book isn't without its flaws and without things that I think uh, need to go under some more martial validity tests. And I think that Anthony actually addresses that to some extent because he speaks to that uh, this as being more an exercise of uh, trying to decipher this kind of information and that not everything can be put together as one case of martial art. And I think that's where I might have one big criticism of this book is because if you're going to call it an illustrated guide to martial arts, at the very least uh, you could then put in a, a good introduction section that really speaks to some of these failures. Now, it's not that he doesn't actually speak to them. It's just that they may not be immediately apparent. And to pick this up and think that you're going to walk away being able to develop an actual martial arts practice out of it, it's probably not really gonna happen. But it can at least give you some insight into what the Vikings may have done and how they may have fought with not just swords and spears and shields, but also axes and the like. Now, the art in it is a very odd style. Uh, this was done on purpose. Anthony actually calls that out. He wanted to have kind of a weird noir look. Uh, and this is done for a couple of reasons that he states in the book in order to make it a little bit easier to understand. But at the end of the day, I feel like uh, different artwork may have been help, more helpful in giving uh, interpretive information into exactly how you might stand uh, because a lot of detail is actually lost in the very strict black and white of these images. And while it may be my biggest criticism to say that yeah, a lot of this information is probably not really going to be useful for actually really reconstructing an actual martial art, uh, at least Anthony does address that. He addressed that very well. Quoting from the book, analyzing the text, the first thing an academic would do is list the pitfalls in attempting to reconstruct the Viking martial arts by using the post-Viking era writings. These include, number one, the time delay between the events of the saga era and the recording of sagas can be average around 200 years. Number two, the authors were writing for a specific audience. Number three, the clothes, weapons, and items of the world in the sagas actually reflect the Christian medieval period of the time of writing. Number four, the subtleties of translation could lead to mistakes. Number five, the writers embellish the feats of those in the stories beyond the reality. These problems are all good reasons not to trust the word of the sagas. Most academics would say it's too problematic to get a correct martial understanding from them. However, the aim of this book is simply to take the basic elements of the combat as described and start to reconstruct them as a martial art not to analyze the historical record in full. So this book becomes a starting point for all Viking enthusiasts to work from as a guideline for reference. While some feel that the reality is too far away to grasp, the author feels that the truths that will be unearthed through this approach are worth the effort of tackling the problems of the sagas writers have left for us. And there you have it. That is his way of saying, look, this isn't going to be a martial arts manual. It's not even going to necessarily even be all that comprehensive, but it's at least a starting place for people to give that Viking flavor, that Viking feel to a martial art and try to better understand what it may have looked like. So while this is an illustrated guide, it's only a partial guide and it's certainly not completely authoritative. 
but I think it's an interesting approach and it's something that I haven't seen done elsewhere. So I think it's a book worth checking out, especially if you're really interested in Vikings and their kind of martial methods, because there's only so much you can really glean from things like sagas and being able to then pull from other martial arts cultures and trying to, again, plug in the dino DNA to recreate something that we just haven't seen in a long time is a very noble and interesting effort. And I think it's a fantastic read. Anthony Cummins does an incredibly good job of bringing together a lot of disparate pieces of information uh, to bring us this book. Uh, everything from Viking sagas to Viking history and even just martial arts cultures from across the globe to help us gain a better understanding of what these weird martial arts may have looked like. And it's a very interesting and noble undertaking to try to apply this to something as honestly as archaic and poorly described as it often is with Viking sagas. With all that said, this is not a perfect book. In fact, I, I feel there are some glaring errors from martial validity standpoints, and there's certainly some holes uh, in terms of being able to connect uh, these pieces of information into a, a kind of an authoritative and comprehensive martial art. But I don't think Anthony would actually disagree with that. And, and again, I think he supports that concept in this book, saying that this is really at best a, a mental exercise and a way of trying to make a best guess at what this would look like. And it's a starting point, but certainly not authoritative. And that's why it doesn't say authoritative guide to Viking martial arts, but it is illustrated. And I think it's a very interesting book. So if you are interested in Vikings, Viking culture, Viking history, or martial arts, whether it be HEMA or otherwise, uh, I would actually recommend this book. I think it's very interesting and it's, it gives you an interesting insight into exactly how much martial information you can glean from the most unlikely of sources. The Illustrated Guide to Viking Martial Arts by Anthony Cummins. Go check it out. I hope you enjoyed this review. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. You can also check out Medieval Review on Patreon.